Howdy everyone, welcome back to the Traditional Thomist. My name is Nicholas Cavazos, and today, as you can see by the title, we have an exceedingly special guest on the show, Professor Scott Hahn. Professor Scott Hahn is, I would say, probably the most famous American Catholic non-priest, um, non-bishop factor, factoring that in. Uh, this was, for me, a personal joy and a personal privilege to have on the show. As many of you know, his book, Rome Sweet Home, uh, I found to be a very intri intriguing book uh, in my road into Catholicism. So it was very nice to have him on the show. Today we're talking about his book, It is Right and Just, and we're talking specifically about the idea of the Catholic social state, the social kingship of Jesus Christ, which is an exceedingly important yet forgotten traditional doctrine of the church today. So I recommend all of you guys to go to the link in the description below and check out his book. For me personally, I found it to be a very intriguing book um, because it add a lot of practical, practical of how we can start to implement the social kingship of Christ um, in our own lives first and then like expanding out from the household into the world. So I definitely recommend you check out the, the book in the description below. Anyway, as always, uh, I hope that you guys continue to pray for me and for the church, and please continue to pray for Dr. Hong. This was an exceedingly uh, tremendous opportunity. Hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show. I definitely appreciate it. It's definitely a, an honor for me personally. In your book, It is Right and Just, uh, what we're talking about today, you really cover this theme of that religion can't just be a virtue that we clasp in here. And that we kind of just privatize and keep by ourselves, but rather that we're not just supposed to go and evangelize the, you know, our neighbor, but we're supposed to take it beyond that and change civilization itself. So for, for those of my viewers that don't know uh, this book, It Is Right and Just, could you maybe give a, the synopsis of what was the thesis uh, and the intention behind writing this book? Well, the thesis is stated in the subtitle, why the future of civilization depends upon true religion. In the background, of course, we have to discuss what we mean by religion, because there are 101 competing definitions of what religion means, you know. And so my co-author, Brandon McGinley, and I begin with Karl Marx's definition that religion is the opium of the masses. And ironically, of course, I would say now, more than a century later, it's almost flipped on its head where Marxism has become the religion of the elite. But regardless, what I want to do is step out of the debate and address what we mean by religion in more ancient and classical terms. And so we recognize that, you know, for Aristotle, for Plato before him, as well as for Seneca and Cicero, in the Greco-Roman philosophical tradition, uh, we have this notion of the four cardinal virtues. It's enshrined, of course, in our catechism. And you start off with prudence, which is the, chariot, the charioteer of the virtues. Uh, but the, the chief moral virtue is justice. So after prudence and fortitude and temperance comes justice, justitia. And we always think of justice primarily in terms of transactional justice or what is called commutative justice. You pay for your groceries before you check out you know, or before you leave. Uh, then, of course, there's distributive justice, also known as social justice, which has to do with the common good and equity. Uh, and even that, too, has been distorted these days in some pretty serious ways. But the third form of justice is actually the highest, and it's the most entirely forgotten, you could almost say obliterated. And that is the preeminent justice where you owe others what, strictly speaking, you cannot repay them. If, for example, you owe your parents and so what is the debt of justice you render? It's pietas in the Latin, piety. You honor your father and mother as we hear in the fourth commandment. Uh, but at the same time, we also have father figures, that is the rulers. And so patria, you know, to the fatherland, patriotism is something that we owe. And so we've got to be willing to sacrifice for the common good of our society. But the highest good, the highest form of justice is religio. And this again is Cicero's term, Seneca. St. Augustine quotes Cicero, purifies the notion, but at the same time concentrates on how we owe God more than everything else. We owe God more than we owe you know, everyone because everything else comes from God. So what do you call the form of justice that we render to God? Hmm. It is religio. What is it 
What form does it take? Sacrifice. You sacrifice to the Lord and him alone. That's Latreia. If you offer that to any creature, that is idolatreia. Mm -hmm. And so we see that this is something that is not only personal, but also social. Uh, human nature is not just rational, it's social and political. So offering God a sacrifice of praise starts on the interior of the heart, as St. Augustine would say. And St. Thomas Aquinas in, the, uh, in question 81 of the Secunda Secunde takes this and purifies and clarifies this and deepens it even more on the virtue of religion. You know, but the, uh, the idea of the title then is, it is right and just to give him thanks and praise, always and everywhere. You know, and so when we recognize that it is our duty as well as our salvation to give him thanks and praise, you know, we realize that we're doing more than just lifting lines from the liturgy of the Novus Ordo Mass. We're really uh, reminding ourselves of what should have been obvious to everyone as it had been throughout the teaching, of, throughout the history of the church. The catechism is really clear, surprisingly clear on this in paragraph 2105, where we read the duty of offering God genuine worship concerns man both individually and socially. And then listen to the next sentence, because the catechism adds, this is the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion and the one church of Christ, period. Now, I thought the catechism taught nothing but the traditional Catholic teachings. Why do you have to stop and insert this statement here? This is the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion and the one church of Christ precisely because so many people have forgotten it. It's become one of the most neglected truths. And so it isn't just simply imposing by force a Christocracy, obviously. We're not going to establish the kingdom of God by force. We're not going to establish the kingdom of God, period. Christ has already done that, and the Father has backed him by giving us the Holy Spirit. So Christ doesn't reign by majority vote or by force of arms or because Caesar got, you know, converted and baptized. No, you know, as he told Pilate, you know, my, the nature of his kingdom is truth. And so universal truth is really the underside of the universal kingship of Christ. And so what else do we do in this book that uh, sort of pertains to the thesis? You know, we argue that man is by nature not only homo sapiens seeking wisdom, but also homo religiosa, that is, we are inescapably religious beings, homo liturgicus. You know, either we're going to adopt the true religion and define our lives by it, or we're going to reject the true religion and not really succeed in opting for no religion. We're going to have a counterfeit religion. And there are dozens of varieties and options. You know, in ancient Israel, the Old Testament prophets had a word for these options, and that was idolatry. There were lots of idols. But ultimately, once you settle the question, what is the source of law? What is the standard of justice? What is the basis for judgment, punishment, and that sort of thing? You've practically speaking identified the society's God. And so religious neutrality is a myth. 30 or 40 years ago, that was very controversial. Now, I think it should have become an empirical fact that is incontrovertible, but there are still some ostriches who have their head in the sand. But I, I think with, you know, cancel culture and, you know, this, this woke generation, we're recognizing that the gloves are come off, the, the gloves have been pulled off. And, and now we're discovering that it really isn't about fascism. It really isn't about communism. It isn't really about conservatism. It's about Christianity of the Catholic sort. Uh, and it starts in the bedroom, and then it spreads to the ballot box. But ultimately, it's a declaration or a, an undeclared war thus far on marriage, on the family, and everything else. One last thought to answer the, the question about the thesis of this book is this book is not all that terribly unique, you know, among the 40 to 50 titles that I've published, because there is, at least I see, a narrative arc that connects the, the first couple of books I did in the 90s, Rome's Sweet Home, Our Journey to Catholicism, where, you know, I was looking at the Catholic faith in terms of the fullness of the faith, the authority of Christ the King, and that sort of thing. Um, and then my second book was called A Father Who Keeps His Promises, God's Covenant Love in Scripture, where I trace the sequence of covenants by which 
God is fathering his family. In the garden, it's a married couple. Aboard the ark, four married couples form a household. You know, there with Abraham, it's now a tribe. At Sinai, Moses has pulled out the 12 tribes of Israel that form not just a nation state, but a national family. And so what is so new about the new covenant, even 2,000 years later, is that it is international. It is universal. It is Catholic. And so the Catholic Church is the only church that really transcends ethnicity, nationalism, regionalism. You know, I considered seriously the various orthodoxies among the autocephalous traditions, the Romanian, the Russian, the Greek, the Serbian, and so on. But they, they struck me as being exactly what the first generation of Jewish Christians had to discern at the Jerusalem Council, that we've got to really lift our vision to recognize that the Catholic faith is no longer reducible to Judaism. It's no longer reducible to Judea or to the capital of Judah. Jerusalem. And so the heavenly Jerusalem is where Christ reigns as the King of Kings. The Pope is not the head of the church. Christ is. He's the vicar of Christ and he'll be held responsible for what he does, faithfully or not. But that recognition to me is the key because suddenly we realize that, you know, the new Jerusalem is continually descending from heaven in every, in every valid mass. And so the next book I did was called The Lamb's Supper, The Mass is Heaven on Earth where I basically explained my discovery that whether I knew it or not, you go to mass and you're surrounded by angels and saints. When I disbelieved it, it didn't make it less real. When I came to accept it, it didn't make it, didn't make it more real. It only made it much more powerful to me and to the other Catholics who are discovering this. And so when you recognize that the nature of God's kingdom is Eucharistic, why? Because wherever the king is, there is the king, and wherever the Holy Eucharist is, there is the kingdom. And so king means kingdom, the Eucharist is the king, and so, you know, this is what the mystery of faith is all about. And so the transcendence, the mystery, the majesty of the mass has got to be rediscovered, because then suddenly we realize that a theocracy has already been established when Jesus ascended into heaven, the parting words to the disciples were, all authority in heaven will be, no, it's not all authority in heaven and earth will be given to me. What was it? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. And so it seems to me that the Great Commission represents our marching orders, and every generation has a, a duty, and our salvation is to fulfill this command performance. And more than just catechetical doctrine, more than Catholic talking points, more than pietistic platitudes. This represents the basis on which we will be judged, each and every one of us, on Judgment Day. But this also represents the basis of divine judgment for every culture, which, like America, which, like Israel back in the first century, receives Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel, and then begins to pick and choose until finally, well, to quote a book title of Robert Bella way back in the 60s, the broken covenant triggers the divine punishments and judgments that come upon every nation down through the ages that accept initially and then begin to reject until finally they break the covenant. And so, you know, I, I, Brandon and I tried to write a rather accessible book that was not about political philosophy. We're both died in the wool Thomas, I perhaps more than Brandon, although he's coming along. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, in going back to the 70s, uh, when I was an undergraduate at Grove City College, I was nicknamed the Evangelical Thomist because in my sophomore year, my medieval philosophy course came right after my modern philosophy course. And there was no comparison between Hegel and Kant on the one hand and Augustine and Aquinas on the other. And so this eventually led me, of course, to open my mind to the biblical basis for the Catholic faith. But I would say all of my books, most all of my talks form a kind of, I could say a jigsaw puzzle. But in a way, it is right and just, might not be the central piece of the puzzle, but it is not just the frame on the outside either. And so I didn't mean to go on so long, but it's been three months since I've been in the classroom. And so I've got all of this stuff backed up inside of me. No, please. No, no I, I love it for sure. Here's an interesting follow-up question. With a doctrine in a teaching that's so important, 
why do you think that in uh, maybe the practical sense, um, many people have forgotten it and have kind of pushed it to the side a bit? Well, I, you know, there are two ways to answer that question. And I, I, we use both ways. You know, on the one hand, earlier in the book, we speak about this Minnesota Vikings running back named Jim Marshall, who still holds all kinds of records from the 60s and the 70s playing defensive end for the Vikings. He had the most interceptions and all of the rest. But what Jim Marshall is the most famous for is what happened on October 25th back in 1964, when earlier in his career, he uh, picked up a fumble from the 49 running back, um, Billy Kilmer. And just instinctively, he knew what to do. He ran it to the end zone. And then to celebrate, he hurled the ball. And he thought that this was a pick six. This was a touchdown, except that when his teammates surrounded him, they were berating him because he had run the wrong way. And so he became known as wrong way Jim. This was the wrong way run. Now, his teammates weren't berating him for committing treason. He wasn't betraying the team. He just was simply acting sincerely, but you could be totally sincere and still be sincerely wrong. And so this illustrates why many Catholics in America today have trouble following this way of thought, because most American Catholics are more American than they are Catholic. And so, you know, on the football field of our lives, you know, we can be running in a way that is sincere and energetic without realizing that we're running in the wrong direction. We've got to set our sights on the only proper goal, which is eternal life, which is the justice that we owe to God above, we, above all the other forms of justice that we owe creatures. And if you get your eye off that elusive goal, which is infinite, but also invisible, so it's understandable that uh, people might miss out on the one thing that matters more than everything else. But in the process, you're going to be doing a lot of things that are sincerely wrong. The other example that I cite near the end of the book concerns what happened in the next decade. It was in, it was in Sweden that uh, two bank robbers came into a vault, took five, four hostages, and they held them for five days until finally um, they uh, stormed the vault. They used tear gas and force, and they took out the two robbers. They also liberated these uh, four hostages there in Stockholm. And much to the shock of the Swedish press and media uh, before the trial, and even in the courtroom, these, uh, these hostages stood up and spoke out in defense of their captors. They even helped raise money for their legal defense. And people were stunned, except for psychologists. And so closer scrutiny came, brought us to what we now call the Stockholm Syndrome. And what is that? Well, it's a description of how people will often internalize the values of their captors as a sort of coping mechanism to just get by with life on a day-to-day -day basis. Even if it's only four or five days, nevertheless, there is a sense in which you rationalize, you justify your behavior. And I think there's a spiritual version of this. The spiritual Stockholm syndrome is that when we live in a society that is so intensely secularized as Western postmodern culture, woke culture, cancel culture, whatever you want to call it, you know, we, we end up wanting to go along to get along. And at this point, we, we, we tend to forget what, what a faithful witness to Christ calls for, and that is something that is countercultural. And uh, you know, this is really, I think, in a sense, what the new evangelization is all about and has been you know, ever since 1983, when John Paul II used that term, and then he used it again, actually, he used it in 79, and then in America here in 83, and then dozens of more times, and then Pope Benedict talked about it even more emphatically, what is the new evangelization? It is re-evangelizing the de-Christianized, you know, and so when you look at the de-Christianized, you're looking also at what I call the new devangelization, which really isn't new anymore. It's been going on for 50, 60, or 70 years. And there's always been a Catholic veneer over American culture, uh, but, but that's been ripped off, I, I would say. Uh, you can see it in the statistical results of the Pew Research poll, where 70% of Catholics in America basically hold the same view of the Eucharist as I did when I was a Presbyterian or even earlier as a Baptist. Uh, and so 
I could go on and on, but I, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, on the one hand, people are running the wrong way, sincerely believing that they're, you know, scoring points. And on the other hand, they've internalized the values of a secular culture that holds us captive in a way that we don't allow ourselves to accept or acknowledge. And, and so as a result, you know, there's almost a sense in which Catholics in America who are more American than Catholic end up looking a lot like lemmings running to the edge of a cliff, you know, because we just don't want to buck the system or, you know, go against the tide, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Here's a good practical question. Yeah, since we don't want to be in captive to this Stockholm syndrome, so to speak, what are good practical methods for Catholics to start in implementing? Because, you know, virtue being habitual, um, you know, it, it would be wonderful if we all just kind of had an off on switch, so to speak, of just, you know, justice, not justice, and we all just flip justice on, and that was it. Um, but what are good practical implementations that we can start to put in our lives and that we can start to do in friend groups on college campuses and maybe at local parishes to start to try to turn the tide and get things rolling? Not only is that a great question, Nicholas, that is the $64,000 question, because once we recognize as Catholics, you know, the truth of the saying that politics is downstream from culture, then we recognize also that this vision is not reducible to what we would call integralism. That is, we don't politically from on high, uh, as much as some of us might welcome the scenario, uh, I don't think anybody here is holding their breath. Uh, what we're reminded of, though, is that if politics is downstream from culture, then building culture starts in the heart through personal prayer with spiritual discipline, but it also builds upon human virtue. And so when we speak of the four cardinal virtues, beginning with prudence and then fortitude, temperance and justice, we're talking about four virtues that really summarize and unify dozens of other virtues, such as Aquinas talks about in the Secunda Secunda. I mean, dozens and dozens of virtues. And so beginning with the virtue of justice that is expressed in personal prayer, daily prayer, scheduled prayer, a morning offering, the rosary, a reading from the gospels, conversational prayer, a mental prayer with our Lord. I mean, that is the cornerstone of a virtuous life. Uh, and then of course, if you're married or if you're called to marriage, then chastity, fidelity, and impure and purity are the things that you need. And so you've got to fight against all of the sources of unchastity and infidelity and impurity, you know, the thousand and one sources that kind of flood this pornographied culture, as it were. And so, you know, I, I wrote another book about three or yeah, about three and a half years ago called The First Society, the Sacrament of Matrimony and the Restoration of the Social Order where I point out that besides your own interior life, your own personal virtue, it really is marriage that represents the building block of society. It isn't the individual who is the basic unit of society. Individualism is not Catholic, nor is it the state. Collectivism isn't either. What is the basic unit of society is the family. And the sacrament of matrimony doesn't make marriage easy. It makes it possible for us to be faithful and fruitful. I remember Father Donald Keefe in my first semester as a doctoral student, brilliant theologian at Marquette, who was not only teaching in the theology program, but also in the law school. And he just made this offhanded comment in the midst of this lecture where we were discussing uh, Richard John Newhouse's book, The Naked Public Square, What is the Role of Religion in Public Discourse? And Newhouse was still Lutheran at the time. It was a few years before he converted and became a Catholic and then a priest. But we were debating it in a doctoral seminar that was evenly divided about five Protestants and five Catholics. And this was in the mid eighties. And so Falwell, Reagan, John Paul was still young enough for you know, the moral majority to kind of you know, uh, exert itself. And so we were deeply divided. And then out of the blue, Father Keefe just interrupted the lecture as well as the conversation by staring out the window. And we didn't know what it was he was staring at, it really turned out to be nothing, but he turned around and he said, you know, we can debate this all the day long, but the fact is, if, if Catholic married couples simply live the grace of matrimony for one generation, the result would be a Christian social order, a Catholic culture. 
regardless of the politicians and the promises they make and then break, regardless of who we elect or fail to elect. Oh, but I digress. And then he went back to his lecture notes and I'm like, keep digressing. You know, that was like a lightning bolt, you know, in the fall, bright blue summer sky, you know, uh, it was, it was stunning. And I, I use that as the opening of my book, The First Society. And in many ways, this book, it is right and just why the future of civilization depends on true religion picks up on that because I think the best way to achieve this goal is to establish the reign of Christ in our hearts and in our homes through personal prayer, through family prayer, uh, and at the same time to recognize that religion has this unique capacity to form civilizations. Augustine emphasizes this in the city of God. He also shows that false religion has this capacity to form corrupt civilizations, not just towns and villages, not just uh, you know, counties and states, but civilizations. And so the Catholic faith is unique among all of the forms of Christianity precisely because it has this capacity to form a civilization of love, again, to borrow from Pope John Paul II. But more than the capacity to form a civilization of love or Catholic civilization, such as we see at its apex in the 13th century, uh, the high Middle Ages, the Catholic religion has this unique capacity to transform sinners into saints, more than bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Uh, the church does not exist primarily to civilize human culture or human history. It really exists primarily to form saints. And this is really a battleground. And so no matter when you live in history, no matter what culture you find yourself immersed in, you know, we're in exile as long as we're not in the heavenly Jerusalem. You know, the problem with exile is this, you know, when you go back to the book of Jeremiah, when he was announcing the exile for the Israelites because of how they had been continuously breaking the sacred covenant with God and so incurring the curses of the covenant, these punitive disciplines that would come down upon the nation and not just individual citizens. You know, he said, when you're driven to the Babylonian territories, build houses, plant gardens, and pray for the peace of the city to which the Lord your God has driven you because of your sins. In other words, repent. And of course, they did in part, but not mostly. Uh, and so by the time you get to the second half of Jeremiah, since his career lasted over 50 years, much like Isaiah's career in the previous century, what really bothers Jeremiah the most is not that the people of God were in exile, is that they didn't know it. They no longer thought of themselves as exile. They were so at home in Babylon, so comfy, cozy, that when 70 years were up and they were allowed to come back and rebuild the Jerusalem temple, the vast majority just stayed put. And the ones who came were impoverished, weak, and vulnerable. And I think there's an analogy for us today, because we're not going to see in the next five years, 70% of Catholics affirming the real presence and reversing it all. I would love to see that, you know, first class miracle. But again, I'm too realistic to say that's likely. Uh, but on the other hand, what I think we need to do is to cultivate Eucharistic amazement. I mean, the fact that we affirm the real presence of the risen body, blood, soul, and divinity of the King of Kings, who is the Lord of Lords, regardless of who occupies the White House. I mean, the fact that we can see it, though we are Americans. I mean, what we see is so tremendous. I think we don't always recognize just how fantastic these sacred mysteries are and why they seem like fantasy to outsiders, to our opponents, and even to those who say they're Catholic but aren't really practicing their faith. And so to cultivate Eucharistic faith, Eucharistic devotion is necessary. But again, John Paul called for something more. In his last encyclical, The Church of the Eucharist, he said, what we've got to do is cultivate Eucharistic amazement, Eucharistic amazement. It's amazing how unamazed we as faithful Catholics can get in taking for granted the sacred mysteries. In, in the, in, let's see, in May of this year, May 21st, our son Jeremiah became Father Jeremiah. We went to his first mass. We heard him pronounce the words of consecration. You know, here's a mortal man who is my own earthly son transforming earthly matter 
into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the God man, the creator and redeemer of the universe, you know, our brains ought to be exploding with some regularity. Our hearts also, because I mean, cultivating Eucharistic amazement on the one hand will remind us of why there's so many unbelievers. And on the other hand, what a gift and how precious it is for us to be given the gift of faith. There is no greater gift than that. And so if we would just simply live out our Eucharistic faith as Catholics and the grace of the sacrament of matrimony for one generation, I think we would be stunned to see the social political results. But in the meantime, it's much easier to point our fingers at poor Catholic politicians who are corrupt, compromised, and totally dishonest as they perjure themselves, not only with their oath of office, but the Latin word for oath is sacramental. When they receive the blessed sacrament in a state of mortal sin and total error, I mean, they are speeding up a process which unfortunately might lead to their damnation. And out of true charity, we've got to oppose them, not just for our own purity's sake, but for their, their eternal destiny as well. You know, and, and again, I, Nicholas, I thank you for indulging me. You know, there's this backlog of stuff that is deeply implanted in my heart that comes out more like lava, I suspect, or at least like a fire hose. <laughs> no, I really, I really do appreciate it. Here's a good, um, I guess, two good practical questions as we kind of start to wrap up. One, one thing I like to emphasize in my show, especially for young men, young men generally struggle with this. And I really like your, your idea that, you know, this starts with the family because, you know, it's very easy for us, as you said, to, you know, just point fingers and say, well, this politician, that politician, or this priest or that priest or whatever, um, does X, Y, and Z and not take responsibility for what we can do right now. It's good to acknowledge the wrong, but then we also have to move on with ourselves and move on. And I noticed that a lot of, um, you know, when it comes to the family, right, that God has ordained that the man should lead the family in virtue towards holiness. But a lot of young men specifically, and a lot of married men, I would suppose as well, struggle with the, the vice of effeminacy, this reluctance to suffer for the sake of some form of pleasure. So I can, I can already hear like a lot of men will hear what you're saying, and I agree 100%. But they'll even just say, you know, it's too hard, <laughs> you know, it's too hard to kind of pick myself up, so to speak, and move on. Do you have any good, maybe practical uh, ways of uh, lifting our souls, so to speak, lifting ourselves out of that, that we can start to implement? Yeah, I mean, two or three initial thoughts. I mean, first of all, it is too hard for us to pick ourselves up. You know, holiness is not just hard, it's humanly impossible. And so when we discover that we are broken, and weak and wayward and at times even wicked we've got to recognize you know um the, the fact of the matter is that we are sinners we're not saints yet and the only way to become a saint is to die in a state of grace but in the process we've got to persevere we have got to struggle and you know the idea that um we are continually falling in the sin that even a righteous man sins seven times a day is a continual reminder that we have got to pray as a matter of justice, but also pray as a matter of, of personal desperation. You know, uh, the soul prays like the body breathes just to stay alive. And as St. Teresa of Avila would say, you know, if, if prayer is to the soul, what breath is to the body, then a lot of people are asphyxiating. But so often the devil gets us to think that, well, I can't pray to God. He would be insulted by my prayers until I can pick myself up by my bootstraps. No the most tender and desired prayer that God could hear is, I can't do it without you. And even with your help, I need more of your efficacious graces, St. Thomas Aquinas would teach. So I think that is the first step. But it's not just the first step followed by other steps. It's the first step that we've got to take every single day. Because the grace of conversion for me when I was a Protestant was what happened to me when I was barely 14 or when I was in my late 20s and I came into the church at the Easter Vigil of 86. But for Catholics, conversion is daily. And you know, to pick up your cross every day is, not, is never gonna be easy. It isn't gonna start becoming fun. It won't be pleasurable. It's not a pillow, it's a cross. And so to cry out, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Don't leave me to my own devices. Or to quote St. Philip Neri, watch out for Philip this day, O Lord, lest he betray you once more. And, and so that honesty, that humility, that accepts our own brokenness and cries out to God, 
acknowledging on the one hand, you love me just as I am? Yes, you're that powerful. You're that loving. On the other hand, you love me too much to leave me the way I am. And so with your grace through the sacraments, by the Holy Spirit, especially through Saint, the Blessed Virgin Mary and Saint Joseph, the Holy Family, uh, and especially young men, chastity, fidelity, purity, these are things that represent the sine qua non. Without these, we will not even achieve sanity in this age, much less sanctity for the next. And so the, the second takeaway that I would suggest would be reading, friendship, get together, you know, uh, get changed, but then get together with other people, brothers in Christ who are going to hold you accountable. Uh, and there are a number of organizations that do this. So, uh, um, you know, so that especially with regard to chastity, fidelity, purity, and that sort of thing. Um, and then lastly, I would say, practically speaking, what you need to do is frequent the sacraments and not simply Holy Communion. Uh, ever since, oh, 35 years ago, I've been going to con confession weekly, at least. And though my wife and my kids don't know what the matter of my confession will be, of course, they never complain that I go too often. You know, living out the medicine of God's mercy is what gives me the courage. You know, it also gives me the strength to wake up, to get up, to, to stand up to the world, the flesh, and the devil, and to enter into the battle, and to accept the fact that I'm going to get wounded. I'm going to have scars, but I'm going to get back up again and recognize that this world is not a playground. It's a battlefield. And that softness, that effeminacy, that, that, that longing for comfort that we all have to fight against has got to be counterbalanced by that steadfast reminder that hell will be the single most uncomfortable place for all eternity, and that you will never rue or regret the sacrifices that you make in order to overcome that disordered desire for pleasure and comfort. And so it's sort of like, do yourself a favor and take up your cross. Do yourself a favor and get to confession. Do yourself a favor and get up, wipe the blood from the wounds, and incur some more so that you will have just cause to merit heaven because Christ is reproducing himself in us, his life, but also his suffering, death, and resurrection. And there is no, there, there is no more noble, there is no nobler calling than this for us as men of God to become soldiers of Christ in the army of God and to win these battles such that when we take our, our cross like Jesus did and he died on the cross, it looked like at last the kingdom of God was ultimately vanquished, but in fact the devil was. And that's what will happen. You know, our failures are good things, but what, you know, I should say our successes are good things, but our failures often turn out to be better things. And as counterintuitive as that is, that's really what the takeaway of affirming or professing the Catholic faith ought to be for us in our daily struggle in life. Yeah, that's very beautiful. I really do love that concept of our failures really do mold us uh, and, you know, by grace can be used to really sanctify us. I guess my final question is, is picking, piggybacking off your last of your three points when it comes to a frequent use of the sacraments, our Lord talks about, I believe it's in St. Luke's gospel, the concept of a house that is not united, right, that's divided into shall fall. And it seems right now that there is quite a bit of division inside of the church, different forces that seem to be, you know, pitted, pitted against each other and engaging each other on the battlefield, so to speak, uh, especially with this latest um, motu proprio that has come out has really pit many Catholics against each other, the motu proprio traditionis custodis. I was wondering, what is your encouragement for most Catholics, uh, you know, dealing with the um, severity of the motu proprio to kind of heal and continue to try to unify and unite the church as we move forward? Because I recognize that we really do all need to be uh, trusting one another and on the same team as we try to advance this cause for Christ. Right. I think it's important yet difficult for Catholics living in our culture to transcend or overcome the partisan divisions. It's natural to fall into them. It's supernatural to rise above them. You know, and so every Catholic is called to be traditional because St. Paul reminds the Thessalonians to hold fast 
to the traditions that you receive from us, either in writing or by word of mouth. So the oral tradition is the context of the liturgy in which the written tradition, that is scripture, is to be read and proclaimed. Just parenthetically, that's why personally, I would like to retire the term Bible or biblical and replace it with sacred scripture, because it's just a, a subtle reminder that sacred scripture belongs in the sacred tradition and in the sacred liturgy. It's a liturgical document as a matter of historical fact, and even an honest atheist historian should be able to admit that with no difficulty. You know, but at the same time, you know, I would say that if we're going to avoid partisan divisions, then we've got to recognize that every Catholic is also called to be charismatic. That doesn't mean speaking in tongues, but it means depending upon the Holy Spirit. It's not 50-50. It's 100-100, but the first 100 has to be the Holy Spirit. St. Thomas Aquinas is very clear on this, that when we speak of the new covenant or the new law in distinct in contrast to the old law, we're not talking about BC versus AD. We're not talking about Malachi, the end of the old, Matthew, the beginning of the new. We're talking about the Holy Spirit dwelling within your heart, empowering you through faith to grow in hope, to achieve perfect love. The Holy Spirit is the new law. The Holy Spirit is the new covenant. And so it really isn't like one or the other. We've got to be tradismatic, as I sometimes say. We've got to be Trentecostals. We've got to love, you know, the Council of Trent as much as Vatican I and Vatican II. We've got to recognize that there have been 21 ecumenical councils, that all of which have been valid. But as Cardinal Ratzinger pointed out in his book, Principles of Catholic Theology, you know, the majority of councils have probably been historical failures in their attempts to renew and to reform the church. I mean, you've got Nicaea, but in the aftermath, you had chaos. You had Chalcedon IV, which we assume just brought tranquility, but it brought even greater confusion. Uh, and so, you know, I think we tend to forget that Trent is the exception. You know, it was preceded by the Fifth Lateran Council in 1512 to 1517 that tried to prevent this spread of heresy. But in 1517, right after the council, Luther is nailing his 95 theses and declaring kind of open conflict, you know. So another thing I'd like to retire respectively, respectfully is calling ourselves Roman Catholic. We tend to forget that that was a term that non-Catholics, especially Protestants, came up with, is particularly in, in England. Uh, and so we are Catholics, not because of the Bishop of Rome as the successor of Peter, who we revere, who we listen to, who we love, who can speak infallibly under extraordinary circumstances, but ordinarily does not, but he is not the head of the church, Christ is, because the church is Catholic, not Roman Catholic. And so when we see that the church in heaven, where Christ is enthroned as the King of Kings, the Blessed Virgin Mary as the Queen of heaven and earth, and the angels and saints aren't, you know, part of another church. The saints aren't dead, they're more alive than we are, they're perfected in holiness, they're in a state of glory. This is the church triumphant, but the church militant has often been somnolent, asleep. The church militant is the pilgrim church. And so you look down through the ages and you see conspicuous failures and historical ages of where the church once flourished and then completely goes away. The seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3 are examples because it isn't legal to offer the Mass in any one of those seven cities. And so when Jesus said, if you don't repent, I'll come and remove your lampstand, he wasn't whistling Dixie or just, you know, issuing idle threats. And so I, I think what we've got to do is to recognize this American tendency to divide up into parties and party spirit and a spirit of partisan, which is really sectarian Catholicism. And, you know, it's, it's unavoidable insofar as we have human nature. This is the natural way to, uh, to, to see things. But we've got to have that supernatural vision, you know, so that we walk by faith and not by sight. And we recognize that if, in fact, Vatican II is valid, and it is, if, in fact, the Novus Ordo is valid, and it is, then it is inexhaustible. But at the same time, it is subject to misinterpretation and abuse as we have ample evidence of, of, what, of what has happened. You know, and so we've really got to take God at his word, the scripture and the tradition, the old and the new. 
Vatican II and Vatican I and the Council of Trent. Uh, the Novus Ordo, but I would also say the traditional Latin Mass is really not the traditionalist Mat Latin Mass, it's the Roman Rite. And so uh, we, we've got to recognize that for the sake of the, the souls, you know, who are needing the sacraments and valid liturgy, we shouldn't, you know, feed steak to an infant. We shouldn't insist upon imposing the categories of the sacred liturgy upon people who've never had the kind of formation needed to appreciate, you know, why what we call the extraordinary form really is extraordinary and more ancient and more reverent and more mysterious and more majestic and all of that. The Novus Ordo has the capacity to make us saints. It's inexhaustible. We shouldn't be targeting or weaponizing that, you know, and so to be Catholic means all of the above, you know, it is to recognize the Greek and the Eastern Rite, as well as the Latin, to breathe with both lungs, the Old Testament and the New, to overcome Marcionism in the second and third centuries, you know, to affirm the Latin and the vernacular, to recognize that the, the pride of place belongs to Gregorian chant, as Sacrosanctum Concilium, you know, stated, and that all of these councils that are valid are not always successful, and so relax, you know, recognize that the earthly tail doesn't wag the heavenly dog, that Christ working by the Holy Spirit through the intercession of the saints is going to get us home. As long as we keep ourselves tuned into this heavenly frequency and take our signals from that and don't overestimate what infallibility means when it pertains to the Pope or to bishops who are part of the magisterium, we listen with docility, but we learn from the word of God as interpreted by these authorities, but it is the word of God. And so Evolution, you know, is an interesting theory, but it is not a meta dogma. It doesn't define the new narrative, that doctrine, morals, liturgy, these have got to change in order for us to truly progress. No, let's retire that also in a respectful way and acknowledge at the end of the day that as members of the church militant, we are united, but just barely to heaven. We are on probation. You know, they're in a state of glory, we're in a state of grace. That means we're vulnerable. That state of grace is losable through mortal sin. The grace that we have is more valuable than the material universe itself. So we've got to hate mortal sin in ourselves and our loved ones and in others too. But in the same time, we've got to recognize that, the, that our need for the medicine of divine mercy is unlimited, but so is the mercy unlimited. Mercy is not just divine pity, that, you know, just tolerates the evil that we try to justify. No, as Aquinas would say, divine mercy is God's omnipotent, uh, omniscient love in actu, in action. And so, you know, if God is at work in us, willing and doing for his good pleasure, the proof of that, as we would read in Philippians 2, is that we are indeed working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We would give up and give in to despair if God was not at work. But the proof that God is at work is our fear and trembling. Uh, it is not the, the cowering fear of a rebellious slave, but it is the cowering fear of the love of a son or daughter who recognizes I've got a unique capacity to sin and to offend my father. He's got an even greater capacity to turn this sinner into a saint. And Lord, here I am. I surrender, you know, not just every day, but every hour. That is beautiful. These types of interviews are my favorite to do just because I know that I'd like to go back and rewatch them a couple of times. <laughs> and It'll so, take at least a couple. <laughs> yeah, and soak them in at least a couple of times. Oh man, I've really thoroughly appreciated. There's even just a couple of phrases that have leapt off at me that I could even see myself going into a session of contemplation just to go and meditate on my own interior life. So I, I do want to thank you so much for that. Well, Nicholas, you're welcome. My yeah. What, one, one thing I really like to do uh, for all of my audience is I really do encourage my audience to pray the rosary for each of my guests. And so know that my audience, it's not very large, but they definitely do appreciate yourself. Uh, they will be praying the rosary for you as well as myself. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for agreeing to come on. Okay. Let me mention too, that if people are interested, you know, before they just click on Amazon, they can mm -hmm. go to the St. Paul Center. Our publishing arm is Emmaus Road, and that, that's who published It Is Right and Just. Mm 
why the future of civilization depends on true religion. This came out shortly after the last presidential election, not soon to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. I just had a book come out a few days ago entitled The Decline and Fall of Sacred Scripture or mm -hmm. How the Bible Became a Secular Book. And I think people will recognize that these two books are sort of like one hand washing the other because the problems don't go back to the 60s or the roaring 20s. They go back really to the dissolution of the medieval synthesis that is probably your favorite and mine mm -hmm. as we find it in the writings and in the life of St. Thomas Aquinas among others. But it, you know, it goes back to the Garden of Eden, obviously, and ultimately, but uh, I think it helps to see how it was really crumbling long before people noticed it. And that's what this book, The Decline and Fall of Sacred Scripture, or how the Bible became a secular book, because it, this is infiltrated uh, Catholic seminaries and universities as much as it did Protestant seminaries. Yeah, absolutely. That is absolutely true. What I'll do for sure is I always like to, yeah, put, put the description, uh, the links in the description for your book, especially going to your site itself. I always just think it's so much better to support the people directly than uh, through Amazon. Although, you know, Amazon's not terrible, but I like That's the right. more direct. Saintpaulcenter.com, I think, is better than Amazon.com. I would agree. To support those apostles who are doing your work in mind. Exactly. I would agree. All righty, Dr. Han. Well, I thoroughly appreciate it uh, taking such uh, this amount of time out of your busy schedule. This was first and foremost an opportunity for me. One thing I really like about this show is even though it is really small, the Lord has definitely blessed me in having lots of interesting guests on yourself. We just had uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider on. Oh, last one of week. my heroes. Yes, yeah, he's an amazing man. I definitely felt as if I was talking to a, a living saint <laughs> before me. And so I just want to say thank you so much again for my for my own sake for coming on, but then also just for, yeah, the impact that you've had in my own life uh, and the lives of so many people around me. So thank you so much. Three thoughts. First of all, you're welcome and thank you. Mm -hmm. Secondly, welcome home, dear brother, a year or two late. Thank you know, you. But also, thirdly, keep up the great work. I have enjoyed this possibly much more than you. But in any case, we won't argue over that. But I just, it's been a sheer delight for me. And so I say thank you to you and keep up the great work, dear brother. I thoroughly, thoroughly appreciate it.